Leather Alderley Mill was closed during much of 2012 to undergo major restoration. As the work drew to a close, Nicola Scattergood was keen to know from the team from Norfolk Millwrights what the work had entailed. I think probably the easiest way to answer that question is to, to kind of talk through the milling process because we've really restored virtually all of the machinery within inside the mill. Um, the, the kind of uh, it starts, I suppose, with a mill pond at the back, and we've overhauled what we call the, the pen trough and the pen stock, which is the piece of machinery, the wooden piece of machinery, which kind of kick starts the whole milling process, if you like. It, it holds the water from the mill pond back, and then when you want the wheels to go, you pull on the lever and that starts the wheels turning. Um, from there we overhauled both sets of the, the mill wheels in here and this mill is quite unusual in that it's got two sets of wheels and they're linked. Um, usually they'll be separate. So we've uh, replaced all the wooden uh, timbers in the wheels themselves, the spokes and the buckets. Um, the, the naves, which is the cast iron hubs, the centres of the wheels, they'd broken so we had to have them recast and on the lower wheel we've uh, managed to retain the original but plate them up and keep them safe for another hundred years or so. Um, from there the water runs out and under the road so that, that's it kind of from the water side. Well those water wheels turn the gears and then through the gears uh, the drives go up to the, the millstones themselves. We've um, realigned some of the shafts because some of the stone had sunk so we've lifted, we've lifted blocks and we've lifted shafts around. We've actually had to replace some of the wooden gears, they've got w well, wooden teeth within the gears. Um, so reshape those and put some new ones in. And then finally um, up to the millstones themselves, we've opened them up, um, refaced them so that they grind properly. And so really we've overhauled everything, every piece of machinery within the, the mill to restore it back to where it was the last time it was working as a fully functional mill. So Jake, it sounds like the role of a millwright requires a lot of specialist knowledge. Could you tell me how I could go about gaining that knowledge and training as a millwright? Myself and my business partner Paul came through the Broads Heritage Skills Training Scheme. Um, I myself trained as a carpenter uh, before that through a modern apprenticeship scheme over three years um, and then became self-employed, uh, decided fairly quickly that I wanted to get into the heritage sector. Uh, it's quite a difficult difficult place to get into. I mean, they're desperate for people, but um, it's quite a hard place to get a foot in the door. Um, so training as a millwright, for me, was, was, a, was a way into the conservation and heritage sector, but also growing up in Norfolk and, and in East Anglia, we're surrounded by mills, so it had always kind of been uh, something I'd been interested in, but never really known a lot about. Uh, so. If I was speaking to future millwrights who wanted to get into it, I'd say definitely look at a background in carpentry or engineering, something similar to that, uh, and then speak to the millwrights who are out there. And how long has Norfolk Millwrights Allowance been running for? We've been running for about three years now. Um, it started out as four millwrights, but one has left us to work on drainage mills in Holland, so uh, now there's just the three of us. The title of the millwright sounds uh, very unusual and fascinating. Could you please tell us a bit more about what it is exactly that you do? It's a very varied job. Um, certainly no two days are the same. Um, and you need to be kind of skilled in lots of different fields. Um, I suppose it's quite an old profession. So you end up working with metals and wood. Um, you need to be a mechanical engineer to understand all the gears have the skills of a blacksmith, skills of a carpenter. Uh, we often do stonework as well, repairs to brickwork, um, tiles for roofs sometimes, or um, working up on wooden um, caps. So th there's an awful lot of skills involved. And as I say, every day is completely different. Sometimes you're in a workshop, uh, quite often you're out on site. Um, you need a lot of uh, thinking, uh, is probably one of the most important skills because um, every single mill, although the principles are the same, the layouts are ever so slightly different. So you spend most of your time thinking, well, how is this, how is this mill different? And what are the peculi peculiarities of this particular mill? And most of the times our problems are kind of hidden because once they were, when they were first built, obviously everything was open and it was easy to get to. And when you're maintaining them, you're, you're caught in confined spaces, uh, on windmills when we work we're up high dangling off ropes 
uh, water mills you're often under the ground working with your feet in water so very varied but very interesting. Jake could you maybe tell me about what your favourite part of the restoration process was? I think uh, my most enjoyable part of the job was um, retoothing the bevel gears. Um, after clunking around in the water wheel pits and with shafts and things it's quite nice to do a bit of fine joinery so they're, um, each one's made bespoke from a beach blank and it's quite a slow methodical way of working and I think after the, the pace of the rest of the job it was a really nice break. And Jake, finally, dare I ask, what was the most difficult part of the restoration process for you? I think the most difficult part of the job was the rebucketing of the lower wheel. Uh, we rebucketed it in August, but it was so cold and, and dank in the pit that you could see, see your breath down there throughout. And coming up into sort of the glorious English summer was, you know, really did feel like a bit of a zombie or a vampire coming out of there blinded, blinded by the light. Um, so, and I mean, it's very tight, confined space, as you can see in the mill. Uh, so I actually had to cut down my favourite set of trestles and uh, get them down there and stand ankle deep in water for about three weeks. Uh, when the weather outside was perfectly good to be doing maybe a painting job or, or a roof or something like that but instead we were down in the down in the depths of the darkness of the pit so that that was probably the least enjoyable part I would have said yeah. Now we're at the final few days of what's been a mammoth project for you both do you feel a bit sad to be leaving the mill behind? Uh, I think it is sad to leave the mill we've spent a lot of time up here in the last year but I think I'd be happy to leave it in the state we're leaving it in, knowing that it's going into good hands and is going to be enjoyed by volunteers and the public who are going to see some, some real milling coming out of it. And then there's always the maintenance. When, when it's been used hard for what it should be, milling flour, then there's always that maintenance and that, that little bit of tender loving care it'll need to keep it going. So no doubt we'll be back. So now it's March 2012 and the mill has reopened to the public. Three afternoons each week in the season, a miller is on hand to explain to visitors how the mill works. My name is Bruce Williams. I'm the miller today in uh, Nether Aldley Mill. I will be demonstrating the machinery to visitors as they come round. So I'll be first of all talking about the water wheels and then later on in engaging the millstone so that we can grind some grain to um, demonstrate the, the milling process. The water comes in from the mill pond into this wooden box here which is our penstock which is the sort of ready use supply of water if you like and then by use of the lever here I can open the um, flap in the bottom which lets water down the penstock onto the wheel. We have two water wheels um, they're both overshot water wheels, overshot um, means the water goes onto the top of the wheel and turns it forward. Very efficient way of using water when you have a sufficient fall of water. And we've got about a 30 foot fall between the level in the mill pond mm. and where the tailways come or goes out onto the road to take the water into Bedley Brook. Um, the two wheels are effectively one above the other, but one's in front of it to offset. So the water goes onto the top wheel, turns that, falls off that onto another trough, goes down, goes onto the top of the bottom wheel then turns that, so we're using the same water twice if you like. The unique thing about this mill is that the two wheels are connected together by gearing. Right. So that um, other water mills will have more than one wheel, but in those each wheel drives different bits of machinery. Right. In this mill, the two wheels together drive right. our machinery. Right. And that's unique in this country and we believe may well be unique in the world now. Right. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll set these going. Um, You'll see the water going onto the top wheel in here. Um, when the top wheel starts turning, if you rush across the balcony there, you'll be able to uh, see the, the lower wheel turning before the water gets to it, simply because, as I say, they're connected together. Uh, we, we have a couple of safety devices which are flaps which um, divert the water around the back of the wheel so that the mechanism doesn't turn when you're not expecting it. So on arrange it so that the water goes on and then let some water on here. So water going on to the top wheel now, filling the bucket. It'll start turning very shortly. 
just beginning to go now. There you go. See as it's turning.